Hello everybody, it's Kuna Mani Caro. I'm back with another reaction today. Today we're going to be reacting to even fancier drinking. Ah, I always love incognito mode internet historian videos, and I'm pretty sure this one is gonna be great. Here we go. Brought to you by Incogni. All right, we've done theater, we've done painting, we've done wine, and now it's time to do some drinking stuff in general. And to start, let us learn about the drinking cultures of the world. Welcome to my private jet. Come on, kid, I got a lot to teach you about the world. <laughs> Aww, we must learn nice. all of the drinking customs like of a giant all ass. the funny foreign places. Starting with where drinking was invented. The country of Uck. Uck. The trick is to jump just before you hit the ground. <laughs> British people in their natural <coughs> habitat. Here they do a thing called cheers, where they clink their glasses together before drinking. The tradition dates back centuries, but the origin, why they started doing it, is somewhat unknown. But we have a couple of theories. Theory one, poisoning. Hmm? Yes. So imagine a situation like this. Two people who don't trust each other, sitting down together at the pub. This guy then does something shady to the other guy's drink. I mean, that happens now, doesn't it? Did you poison my drink? Me? I would never. Well then, I'll pour a little of mine into yours, and you can pour a little of yours into mine, and we'll both either be totally fine or both totally but that's dead. That's no, that's different no, from there's, cheering. There's no right? need to do that. So that was the initial version, and then eventually they just kind of shortcutted it to, yeah, clink, clink, it's fine, I trust you. But that's probably a myth. Yeah, that one sounds so like a myth. Theory number two. I don't think that one's true. Ghosts. Right, in the Middle Ages, people were worried about spooky ghosts and spirits. So they <laughs> fears very loudly to scare away the demons. Also, sometimes you'd spill some of your drink onto the uh. table and the floor, and then that was like a little offering to the spirit. <laughs> but that's probably also true. I the hope that. The most likely answer is simply is that filthy. everyone likes that sound. Ah, very satisfying. There's more. You know when someone drops a glass and everyone goes kind of silent, like, are oh, you fucking idiot? Well, in the UK, Who it's drops the everyone glass? goes, way in celebration. As a way to Wait, make really? fun of you, but also make you feel not so bad. Uh-oh. The That's, BBC. What is it called? They have when I used to be a server, what do, what do they used to say when they drop it? Donka Shane? It's <laughs> that? I'm pretty sure it's not Dakashay. What is it? It's another thing. It's like Greek or something, right? I'm pretty sure there's this, there's something people say. Oh my god, why can't I think of it? Or is it like Jewish or something? Not Jewish. That's not the language. What is it called? Hebrew something. I don't, I don't know. If you know what I'm talking about, put it down in the comments. I can't think of the word right now. Ahoy? Ahoy hoy? That's Mr. Burns. <laughs> <laughs> have a whole organization for that now? We gotta get out of here. We'll take my private cruise ship. Come, come to Italy, where they film the Mario movie. Let me just park this here. Chai, this is actually real. Come this way to the Leaning Tower of Pizza. Held up by the raw strength <laughs> of a thousand tourists posing for photos. Oh my god, is literally everyone doing that but same thing? Did post? you know that oh. Italians, when they say cheers, say chin chin? Chin chin. Now, that is very funny to the Japanese because in it's Japanese, penis. chin chin means penis. Yeah. Germany next. Now, here they do Bruderschaft, where you link your arms together when drinking. It's also kind of seen all over the world at weddings in particular, but only the Germans have a name for it. It symbolizes the end of formalities between two people. But the Germans have a lot more. Now, when you clink glasses together with someone, you have to look them directly in the eye. What's the point of those, like, fancy you glasses? Do it, you will be cursed with seven years of bad sex. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's the German. <laughs> when, when doing shots in Germany, they sometimes also go, Zermit, and you hold Zermit? the glass near your belly. Zertit, 
your chest, and then some sack, and you hold it near your. You know, <laughs> That's not you real, is it? And you drink. Now on to Finland. They keep that is casual. real. They have a custom specifically oh for God. drinking alone. You're supposed to do it while loafing around in your underpants, and it's called Kalsani uh -huh. Kani, also known as underwear drunk. All right, Isn't that just like being Finland. depressed so or something? To Canada. To get there, I booked us a private fishing trawler. It's so exclusive that even these fish, yes, they go to a private school. <laughs> in Newfoundland, Canada, they have the Newfoundland Screech. You take a shot of Screech, and then you do the Screech. Goes like this. Is you a Screecher? And then you answer like this. Deed I am, me old cock, and long may your big jib draw. That's huh? it. It's a pirate culture. Then they take a big fish, usually a cod, and they kiss it on the lips. Uh. Anyway, I'm <laughs> kind of I'm kind of busy, so uh, there's no more customs anywhere in the world. You can do some more, maybe uh, independent <laughs> research yourself. I'll, I'll see you back in the field. End of part. Wait, is it really? Was that it? Okay, this next section is on cocktails. Oh. So, so the video. it all started when uh -huh. we made this asset where the Irish character, he's shaking a cocktail at a frat party, and I turned to the editor and I went, wait a minute, that's a weird word. Why are they called cocktails? And we started Googling it, and we kind of went down a rabbit hole, and it was actually really interesting. So, here it is. Cocktails. In the 1700s, fuel prices were <laughs> Real in the 1700s. So, everybody used the horse. Now, horses weren't just used for travel, they were him? also used for work in the fields. So you would sometimes put a harness on a horse for plowing a field, right? Now, when you do that, Why its tail his ass? actually gets in the way, and so we have to do something about that thing. Think of it like the foreskin of the horse. You put it in the guillotine, and everybody closes their eyes. <gasps> Oh my god, up. really? Now, this practice is called docking. It has a different meaning these days. <laughs> so once the tail is docked, some say it's much easier to clean. But it also kind of looks like a chicken's tail, right? Hence, they would call these tails cocktails. So that's step one in the story. Step two. You've also got horse mm. merchants, right? And they are a very shrewd bunch. They know that Shrewd. when they sell their horses, the customer wants very feisty and energetic animals. Someone who's buying a horse doesn't want one that's kind of sickly, or lazy, Aww. or sleeping all the time, right? They need it for tired. work. So how do you ensure, then, that your horse looks full of beans and moxie and some other stuff, and has the maximum horsepower possible when it's time to sell? Well, they would use this one quick hack. All the equestrians hate them. Oh. They would go over to their Apparently I don't remember Mythbusters that well. And they would <laughs> some chili, hmm, some ginger, and a few other spices, and just mix it all together. Then they would go over to the horse, and oh, hold still, little fella, and with the mixture go up into the... Oh, door. no! Now, the horse doesn't like that very oh much. Oh my so god. It's, kicking, it's going mad, and the bidders are all going, wow, this is a really great horse. They literally just stuck peppers up its ass. What the fuck? Oh my god. Bunk, I tell ya, I'm buying it. So the horse merchants made a whole bunch of money, and everyone was happy. Well, <laughs> almost everyone. <laughs> the end. <laughs> of step two. Now step three. Around the same time, you've got bartenders over in the saloon, and they have just invented the science of mixology. They've realized that you can add Red Bull and lemon juice to stuff, and actually make alcohol not taste so bad. But when they added some ginger and spices and maybe a little bit of pepper, people went, ginger oh, and spice and everything these. nice. These are those horse suppositories. Sugar Cocktails, spice, we'll ginger. call them. Glug, 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 glug. And the name stuck. That's kind of inter inter interesting. You think it's too early for ad time? I don't think it's too early for ad time. 
Oh, boy. Oh, no. Help me, Incogni Man. I signed up for discounts at a retail store and they won't stop sending me messages. <laughs> huh? I signed up to that website years ago. Why are they still spamming me? <laughs> that would be my doing. I am Data Beast Man. <laughs> oh, my God. Who will, will stop, stop him? him? It's me, Incogni Man. Incogni is the brilliant service that tells a whole bunch of databases and people who have your data and stuff to get fucking lost. It says, <laughs> do you have this email address? Well, lose it. Hey, marketer man, you can't use this phone number anymore. Instead of chasing them all up manually by signing up to Incogni, they send these legal requests on your behalf to get you deleted from the internet. Let us do better in my room. And then we teleport to the desert. I better follow him. Incogni portal. Good of you to finally join us. Yeah, well, I'm going to stop you. Incogni lawyer powers, legal threats, data <laughs> removal <laughs> tools, Consumer Privacy Act, data protection regulations, polite yet stern wording. Yet stern. It has created a Gundam. <laughs> so go to incognito.com. I was going to say, was it like a Megazord? Get up today and get 60% off an annual plan. I won't change numbers. I won't change email addresses. I'll just simply take them back. I can feel it working. I never had that problem. My phone isn't ringing as often. With any company. My email inbox, it's less full. With uh, just a whole bunch of I guess of like shit. eBay, and but it like says like stuff you watched or like looked at before, which well, I don't really I'm find that annoying because sometimes I want to know what I looked at or watched. He'll die of the cold eventually. <laughs> And up and it's an old man. He's like, not bad, kid. <laughs> not bad so go to incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. And over. Have you heard about the latest dangerous trend? It's all over social media. Wine mixed with watermelon. A combination when mixed Isn't together it just water? makes a deadly poison. Here we are in Argentina with a delicious watermelon. Now let me chase it down with a glass of <gasps> wine. <laughs> okay, it's not true. But it's been a myth in South America for over a hundred years that you should never pair wine and watermelon together. No one quite knows why, but we dug and we dug and we were able to find a single source from an author, Facundo de Genova. And he says, in probably Argentina, probably, probably Argentina, there was a small the Catholic church. Isn't there a resident evil? Was great. For a time, they grew wine for dinner. Mm -hmm. And Wait, it's resident evil. For dessert. Of course, Until one know. day, something bad happened <sighs> in their idyllic little town. A few men in the village started getting a bit... It is Resident Evil. Grabby. It was a whole Me Too thing, but it was the first Me Too. It was a Me One. No one quite knows who did what to whom, but it was a big scandal, I tell you. And it kept happening. Oh no, what's happening to our beautiful our village? They said in their funny foreign accents. Now, presiding over the village was a monastery. So the priests all gathered together at this monastery to figure out what the hell's going on with all this grabbiness. Yeah, this is a town of sucks now. <laughs> I hope you have the plan to fix this. Uh, yes, of course we do. But first, we must figure out why the men are becoming so grabby. Come on, guys, think outside the box. We have Maybe to find like something, an anything to blame. Except the people who actually did the thing. <laughs> so we began looking at the diets of the people in the village. Hmm, the priest said aloud. One of the monks proposed a theory. Have you noticed that we grow a lot of grapes here? Yes. And have you noticed that we also grow a lot of watermelon? Yeah. Well, what if, you know, somehow it makes the men <laughs> look grabby? That must be it. We must put a stop to this. But what? How, well, let's tell them that if they drink wine and eat watermelon, they'll go to hell. Okay. So that's what they did. Hear ye, hear ye, do not drink wine and then eat watermelon. You'll go to hell. Oh, really? Uh, really? Oh, really? really? See, I don't know that. Maybe it's really, really, really. And it worked. The assaults suddenly stopped. Hurrah. 
Although whether that was a coincidence, we don't actually know. Over time, however, the messaging kind of evolved because don't mix wine with watermelon isn't exactly a well-known Bible proverb, and people became less religious. So instead of, you'll go to hell, the line changed to, it's poison and you'll die. And in Argentina, in some places, the myth still perpetuates. Now, is there actually any evidence at all that pairing wine and watermelon together really causes the mood? Kinda. Watermelon contains an amino acid, arginine, which partially transforms into nitric oxide, and then nitric oxide is a vasodilator. And vasodilators uh, do this. Oh, like Plus, wine also literally has dilates. And that also helps in the formation of nitric oxide. So, double this. Oh. But the effect from nitric oxide is actually very mild. Also, all of these foods have polyphenols and arginine in them as well. So pretty much everything has it. So, no, the effects are likely hugely overstated. So, the moral of the story is... Is... Okay. Okay, no moral of the story. <laughs> this next section is on wine in the Bible. Sort of. Apologies if we got any details wrong. We mostly kept this section because we liked the pun on Eucharist. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping forward to Jesus. This is his first recorded miracle. So, Jesus and a whole bunch of his followers and stuff, they are invited to a wedding in Cana. Now, the waiter goes over to serve some guests some wine, and... Uh-oh. It's empty. Oh, that's a dude. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought he was no, wearing a headband. A plan, says Jesus. I mean, I do wear a headband, too. If you Bring mind. me six big stone jugs, about 20 to 30 gallons each, and fill them up to the brim with H2O. Now, check out this. And he does the finger thing. And then when they went to pour the water, suddenly it was wine. And it was the best wine that anyone had ever had. And they go, oh, that's pretty good, Jesus. But have you got any other miracles? And he says, yes. Come on, we're going to do a supper. Now, everyone is gathered around, and this is the point Supper is a miracle? Reveals. By the way, one of you is very sus. I know one of you will betray me. And he looks at Judas, and Judas is kind of looking away. But then Da Vinci's like, Guys, uh, I need you to stay uh, still for the painting. So Jesus goes, watch this. And he takes some bread and wine, and he says, Look at this bread. This is my flesh. And everyone's kind of like, Really? And he goes, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're Protestant, then just metaphorically. No, no, okay, look at this wine. It is my blood. Really? Quit making this so complicated. Here, have some. So he hands it to his disciples, and they were fantastic. I was peckish and <coughs> thirsty. And he goes, yes, in fact, I shall call this little celebration a Eucharist, or Holy Communion. It will be the practice oh. of eating one cracker or piece of bread and drinking some wine. And if you eat the whole thing and drink the whole bottle, that's called a huge caress. Now, most Christians Wait, is that really a take thing? it as a symbolic thing. Unless <laughs> you are Catholic. Now, they believe in what's called transubstantiation, which means that the bread and wine literally turns into the body and blood of Jesus at the moment that they are consumed. However, oh. it does still look like bread and wine, and they call that phenomenon appearance or accident. It has changed, but you just can't tell, except for sometimes when you actually can. Lanciano, Italy, in the 8th century, there is a monk and he has been on r slash atheism for far <laughs> too long. He is starting to have doubts about the blood and wine stuff, but he still has his monkly responsibilities. So, he holds mass and he says the words of consecration, this is my body, this is my blood, this is my rifle, this is my gun, and at that very moment, the bread turns into literal flesh in his hands. And the wine turned to blood. Jesus, man. Holy shit, everybody <laughs> in unison. And ironically, he went, oh, well, I should probably not eat this then. So instead, he kept it in this chalice thing. What is it? A clock? Anyway, there it remains still today, kept in the church of San Francesco. 
That's and now, gross. a couple of years later, in the 1970s, Professor Odaro Leone decides, let me do a bit of an experiment. So he took a sample of the flesh, and he came to the conclusion that it was indeed real. Apparently, it was part of a heart valve, and that the blood type was AB. The sample has not been analyzed since. However, it is officially recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Here ends the reading. Now you might say, wow, that section really doesn't have a whole lot to do with wine. And in fact, you're just badly retelling a Bible story. This final section we started making <laughs> I was waiting for a response. A court document, and we thought, holy shit, this is a hell of a story. And we had all these ideas of it being like Witcher themed, and so there were quite a few like random Witcher assets, just ignore that. But it just kept blooming and blooming into this bigger story, and it got too long. And so here it is on Incognito. And here we begin in 1743. <laughs> the birth of Thomas Jefferson. Push, Mrs. Jefferson, push. Now, Tom Jeff. Yeah. He was involved with some politics. Kind of sexy, but you're too late. He's dead. But what's more important is he tried his hand at a lot of different hobbies. Architecture. He designed his own home in Monticello. He played the violin. He kept mockingbirds. He collected fossils. And, most relevant of all, he hoarded a culture. In his I need to stop falling asleep. I keep falling asleep. Types of vegetables and hundred and so just like a little, um, a little. What is that called? A little notice, because you might have noticed I kind of uh, tilted out right there. <laughs> I am narcoleptic, so I. It is hard for me to sit down at long periods of time, especially because I'm watching this right after work. So if you ever see me like not off like that. It's not because I'm bored or anything. It's just like I, I literally can't help it. My body just shuts off sometimes and I just pass out doing whatever the hell I am doing. <laughs> I'm happy I stayed in my seat. Damn. Okay, let's keep watching. 70 types of fruit. One of those fruits was grapes. So he tried his hand at viniculture. And while he was good at a lot of things, he never saw much success with making wine. So, he mostly collected the stuff. Now, people naturally wondered, like, hey, what happened to the wine he made and the wine he collected? Did he sell it all? Did he give it away? Did he attempt the huge caress? Huge Fast caress. forward, 1985. Meet German music producer Hardy Rodenstock. He is an avid wine collector. And he's tapping on the walls of old buildings in Paris, looking for some national treasures. On this occasion, he found the wall opened, and my God, sealed behind, he said that he found a collection of 24 bottles, dating all the way back to the 1780s, and <gasps> look at that, oh, THJ engraved. That right must have been so cool to find that. Though. Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Jefferson. Like Mr. Rodenstock has stumbled upon Jeff's hidden collection. Mystery solved. And it would make sense that they wound up in France because Jefferson spent a number of years over there. Amazing. And into Rodenstock's wine collection, they went. Now, Rodenstock's wine collection was something quite special, and he liked to show it off. So every year he would host tasting events that featured extremely rare wines. And he would invite all the most prominent German celebrities such as the Hans Brothers, and Das Boot, Was. and Death Stranding. That's now, Boot? One of his guests was a guy named Michael Broadbent, the senior director for Christie's Auction House. Together, they cracked open one of the THJ bottles. Bottle number one. Broadbent said that the wine was delicious. Yup, these bottles are in perfect condition, he said. You should really auction these things. I run an auction, you should put them in there. Huh. Maybe I should, said Mr. Rodenstock. Maybe I should. But before they did that, they, they sold that. two of the bottles privately. Number two and number three. And they drank a fourth. On the 5th of December, 1985, they put up bottle number five for auction at Christie's. It was bought by Christopher Forbes for 
thousand pounds. Damn. Which is that money just to buy a drink? The most expensive bottle of wine ever sold. But that wine wasn't to drink. Proudly, that thing sat on the Forbes shelf. Eventually to be really? put into the Forbes gallery in the exhibit on former presidents. And funnily enough, they actually put this bottle on display under a big industrial light and it heated the thing something fierce. And the heat ruined its drinkability, of course. In fact, so intense was the light that the glass expanded and the cork fell into the bottle. Some time passed. They celebrated the sale with another drink. Bottle number six, now gone. And then they sold two more privately. In 1987, they drank bottle number nine. In 1988, they drank bottle number 10. And at this point, a new challenger enters the sea. The White Wolf of Palm Beach. They call him Bill Coke. Some Coke. say it's short for billionaire. He's a member of one of the wealthiest families in America. The Coke family? And he is also one of the world's most avid collectors of wine. So they oh, yeah, sell like, him a total you need of so much four wine? bottles. For three hundred and eleven thousand eight hundred and four dollars, we're way over here on the graph at this point. So, Damn. gently, careful, careful now. He put them in his climate-controlled cellar, and he would show them off to his friends. Otherwise, here they remained for the next seventeen years. As the years ticked by, more bottles were sold and more bottles were consumed, until there were none left 2005 the four coke bottles had sat around for a long time on the shelf doing nothing when something new happened the boston museum of fine arts was interested in displaying the bottles and wanted to trace the exact provenance so coke gets on the line with the jefferson foundation and he goes i oh, look i don't mean to brag but i'm about to have my bottles displayed at the boston museum but I need just a little bit like of verification. Little Could you tell me exactly where these bottles Boston come from? Museum. And the Thomas Jefferson Foundation responded, uh, I'm afraid we can't do that. We don't think they're real. Yeah. In fact, you're not the only person to call about this. What? Yes, it was in the 80s. A Mr. Broadbent, I believe, of Christie's Auction House called up trying to verify the bottles so that he could sell them. But we looked through our comprehensive historical records and found no mention of these bottles. Here's a letter we sent saying that we couldn't verify them. And they're probably fake. But, 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 he sold those bottles to me. Now, back to 1776. Now, here's a thing you should know about Jefferson. Let's just say if he was around today, he would play a lot of Factorio. <laughs> <laughs> you know... I have the largest collection of Funko Pops in the world. And that oh. meant that his record keeping I mean, was do you? very collect meticulous. You want to collect. All of his anime was ordered alphabetically. And so too were all the things that he ever purchased, including wine. Uh, he honestly sounds like an anime person. So that's my story, Mr. Pepsi. And those bottles are probably fake. When Coke hears about this, he hangs up the phone and hits speed dial on his pager or something, and he I need to assemble a team, a team of investigators. Mr. Rodenstock lived in Germany, so Coke's investigators scoured the countryside for clues, and eventually they found a lead. They managed to track down five German residents who claimed to have done engraving work for Rodenstock in the past. They said, hey, have you seen these bottles before? And they went, oh yeah, we have. We did those. And all five were certain that the THJ engravings were done by an electric power tool. Every one of these 24 bottles of Jefferson wine were fake. Big fat phonies. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. So Bill takes all of this evidence to court and Rodenstock is summoned, but he doesn't show up. So Bill wins oh. in absentia and is awarded a million bucks. <coughs> in the end, Bill never received any money from Rodenstock. Oh my God, But really? to Bill, it was about sending a message more than receiving any money. I'm coming after you. And it's just one battle of many that Bill has fought against counterfeit wine. In 2008, Coke filed a consumer fraud lawsuit against the Chicago Wine Company, uh -huh. which was later settled out of court. 
another time. Coke spent three point five oh, yeah. million dollars buying nearly I need to stop. bottles of wine from Zaki's auction house. Almost a third of a million dollars worth was fake. The auction house settled out of court, but the seller was told to pay three hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars in damages and another thousand dollars for every bottle. But then the next day they went, you know what, we thought about it. This jury has decided to award you twelve million dollars in punitive damages. Jackpot, said Mr. Coke, I'm rich. <laughs> but a year later, the court changed its mind and awarded Coke only $711,000. Okay, so this guy's like a one-man army, and he's going around trying to scare the shit out of anyone who's selling fake wine. Oh, you've got expensive rare wine, do you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll buy it then. Yeah, but no, uh, yeah, I'll buy it. No, it's fine. It's genuine, is it? Yeah, you're saying it's genuine. Yeah, definitely. And then he goes and he inspects it, then finds it's fake, and then goes, yeah, I knew all along, stupid. Lawsuit time. Oh my God. By doing this, he's very slowly cleaning up the market. After all of these investigations, Bill has spent around $35 million like, whatever, like, tracking down like fake wine. Drunk. But by 2016, Where's Coke was ready was? to lay down his weapons. He sold off a big chunk of his collection, and it sold for $22 million which means he likely did not break even. So <laughs> consider giving to his GoFundMe. Now, this is actually just a very small part of the story. This scandal ended up making such waves across the wine industry that they decided to make a movie about it. Oh, damn, based on really? the Benjamin Wallace book, In The, the book. Billionaire's Vinegar. And it was set to star Brad Pitt. No, wait, now it's Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> no, wait, it looks like it's canceled. All right, that's the video. Thanks for watching. Four more to go, but we've already started in on the regular type stuff in case you don't love fancy. Okay, bye. And don't forget, incognito.com slash incognito. Oh, so that's our video. Ah! Wait, 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 wait. Okay, so that was our video. Fan what was it called? Too Fancy Furious? Too Fancy Brought Furious. Brought to you by Even fancier drinking. So I did find that one interesting. I do apologize for myself like nodding off kind of here and there. It wasn't on purpose, I swear, I swear, I swear. It's it's just my body kind of sucks. <laughs> Thank you for sitting down and watching with me and I'll see you guys later, bye.